So everyone, welcome to the Youth Investment Fund's first webinar for phase two. Um, just to introduce myself, I am Jenny Smith. So I'm the customer manager at Social Investment Business, um, who are delivering um, a lot of the fund. Um, so just to highlight, um, this is the first of two seminars that we're running. So the second one is on the 6th of October at 6 p.m. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, uh, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions in the Q&A box. So I kind of encourage you guys to add in any questions. Hopefully we'll answer some that you might have outstanding of the fund over the next sort of half an hour. But if not, we'll have a good amount of time to discuss any questions or anything like that. If we don't get to your question, um, hopefully we will be able to get back to you um, after the period of time so if we need to sort out and follow up on any of questions we can send that out to all attendees in the seminar and as well as that um, update our FAQs on the website. So first I'm just going to introduce um, the other people that we have on the call. Uh, so each of the individuals have a time to speak and kind of introduce themselves as a partner but um, the youth investment phase two is delivered as a partnership. So we have Paul Schofield from DCMS, uh, Lara Bell from Resonance, Barry and Karen from NYA. We have slight technical issues with Jed um, representing key funds, so he should be along in a few moments. Now, the aim of the sem seminar is to provide a bit more kind of detail around the fund priorities, eligibility, and the application process. Um, we will kind of stick within the parameters of that seminar and then hopefully if there, we can kind of continue this series over a longer period of time to kind of talk more in detail around assessment and things that we're looking for. Um, first, I'll be kind of discussing the fund as an overview, um, any and the application process. Then we'll move to Paul from DCMS to discuss kind of what we're looking for within the fund, the fund priorities, the eligible geographical areas. Then a moment from Resonance and Key Fund to discuss their role within the fund. And finally, the National Youth Agency to discuss um, their role and input into the Youth Investment Fund. So if I just start, the Youth Investment Fund is £368 million fund that's looking to create, expand and improve young people's services and facilities. Um, the fund itself is being delivered as a partnership and hopefully you'll kind of get a bit more detail on kind of all the roles that we'll play. Um, there are kind of four key areas that the Youth Investment Fund is trying to do. Please forgive me if I read them off my notes, uh, they're a bit of a mouthful, but what we're trying to do is to improve health and well-being of young people, equip them with the skills to pursue their work and life, empower young people to be active members of the community um, and the society that they live in, and finally level up the provision in selectable, selected eligible areas of England. Now, DCMS can kind of speak a bit more to the priorities and what we're trying to achieve as a fund. Um, but what I just want to kind of provide a bit more detail on how the fund will be working in the application process. So the first key thing to kind of remember is that we are working within eligible geographical areas. So the site that you might be looking to get um, capital and revenue funding for must be in those areas. On our website, we have a postcode checker to kind of to help, to help you identify whether your postcode is within those eligible areas. The, the submission itself is an expression of interest form that can be found on our website. Um, there, are there is an offline version of all the questions that we'll be asking, but it should be quite a simple form to provide all of the information that you need, um, that we need to kind of assess your eligibility of the fund. Um, you can, the key thing to remember is that what we're encouraging all organisations to do is to apply and kind of show interest in the fund. You don't necessarily need to sub be ready and have all your ducks in a row to submit an expression of interest. What we're really interested in is to kind of gather an understanding of the pipeline that you of who are interested in applying for the fund. Um, at the moment, as part of our current fund priorities, we're looking at large scale ready to go projects. This means that kind of smaller projects that may submit an EOI at the moment or kind of are still scoping out feasibility of the project might not necessarily be assigned a relationship manager for assessment immediately, but we don't want that to put, put you off for applying. It's something that we kind of want to gain an understanding of where you're at as, a, as an organization and how you might progress in the future. 
Um, at the moment, the fund is running till 2025. And we, are under, we assume that the expression of interest form will be open throughout that period until March 2024, as we'll be running grant committees up until that point. After this, um, we expect that all of the youth investment funds money to be spent by March 2025. So these are kind of the key dates that we should be looking at in our timeline of the fund. The important thing to know is that if you are applying to the fund as a partnership, um, as an applicant, you will identify a lead organisation. That lead organisation will be accountable for the grant and also be the key point of contact for all relationship, for the relationship manager to assess and identify whether the application is right for the fund. So those are kind of the key kind of top line points that I want to express about the um, application process. Um, if I pass you over to Paul um, to kind of give you a bit more of a detailed understanding from DCMS's perspective. <clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, I'm Paul Scalefield, I'm the uh, Lead Engagement Manager uh, on the DCMS side for, uh, for, the IF, uh, for the IF Fund. And I think what um, DCMS, what government, what ministers are trying to achieve through this uh, £358 million two and a half year investment is really a number of key outcomes. Firstly, we want, we're looking for additionality. So does this bid increase the number, the range, the quality of services for young people that your, uh, that your organization or group of organizations deliver. Secondly, we're looking for that to be delivered through youth work outcomes. So um, we're not funding sport for its own sake. We're not funding arts for its own sake. Uh, what we, we're, we're happy to fund organizations that deliver youth work through uh, some of those media. But the idea really is that, um, is, is that the is that we are looking for emotional and social educational outcomes um, rather than, for example, pure sporting excellence or, or in, increasing some of those uh, in some of those um, those kinds of more narrowly defined outcomes. Um, the third thing we're looking for, obviously, is value for money. So uh, we're looking for them to make sure that the money that is spent is uh, is spent uh, in 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 the most efficient way possible to reach them at the uh, the highest number of targeted young people. Certainly to, uh, to look if you can bring in uh, funding from other sources to complement the funding that, uh, that, you, can, that, you, that you can obtain through, uh, through YIF, that again would be a bonus. And <clears throat> most importantly, we're looking for sustainability. And I think that's, um, th that in, in its primary sense, in our view, is about are we investing in uh, organisations that continue to deliver and improve services for young people through the... Um, through the coming years and that bluntly if we turn around in five years time and find the facility we've been investing in is no longer delivering youth services that is something we would we, we, we would we would want to guard against through um through various means and that's not something that we we, we would want to uh, uh, uh to encourage at all so there's a sustainability aspect from that point of view and uh, also when we talk about sustainability we're talking about contributing to the government's net zero agenda so for example is this going to is this capital investment going to make your building more sustainable from an environmental point of view um as well as uh, as well as any other now if we just talk about a little bit about the um the uh, the the investment areas that were chosen government has to um choose um, uh, when we're looking at these things, we, we have to make sure that the, uh, the criteria we're using are transparent, are uh, from reliable government data, and uh, are, are, um, are, are, are decent proxies for what we're trying to achieve. And so we've come up with the list of, of, of areas that are, that are there, they're targeted to try and um, um, uh, work out where the, uh, the greatest need is and where some of the most, um, in terms of in terms of young people who 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 can, who can benefit, and in terms of those places that um, where a youth investment and investment in youth services is uh, it is it is, it is most um, uh, uh, fragile. Now, um, the issue there for us is that those boundaries are ironclad. If um, we started to invest outside of those boundaries in areas that might serve some of our uh, of the young people but the facilities themselves were not in those areas we'd get ourselves into all sorts of trouble with uh, with those areas that felt themselves excluded um for, uh, for other reasons and and the uh, and, and the preston would collapse the uh, the geographical nature of the fund so unfortunately it might be that in some areas 
the, the areas we've chosen from from a local point of view might m might seem counterintuitive, but for very good reasons we have to respect the boundaries of those that we've chosen. Um, just a little more really about the um, about the kinds of organisations we're looking to, um, to to support in this investment. Obviously, local government is, is that is they, if they if they're providing youth services in that area, or their kind of commission partners as long as they are non profit. Um, and uh, independent um, uh, VCSE uniformed youth organisations. So, um, you know, any kind of charity, um, uh, CIC, those kinds of, uh, of issues. What we can't, uh, what we, what those are outside, outside of the fund are those that are essentially for profit and, 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 uh, and, uh, and other statutory providers, essentially schools, uh, schools and colleges. We can't um, overstep that departmental boundary by investing in, um, organizations and, and improving the uh, the facilities for the uh, of, of uh, facilities that you said that they essentially are the purview of the department for education that would be uh, that would be um, uh, go beyond the powers of the department our department DCMS to uh, to work with so uh, those are the kind of key constraints and those are uh, hopefully is a little overview of the kind of things that we're uh, kind of outcomes that we're trying to um, to get from the fund and uh, I'll happily pass on to the next speaker Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, and just to just to touch on what Paul was mentioning before, I'm managing all of our inquiries at the moment, and I think there are some kind of common questions around the breadth of what we are willing to fund and not. And I just think want to highlight a few common questions that we have. So the fund itself cannot be used to purchase a site or a building, um, as well as more um, fixtures and fittings. Um, that do, are not part of a more substantial construction project. And finally, um, buses and more mobile vehicles. So buses that often deliver youth activities as well as boats, um, other areas like that. Um, finally, I think there's just a common kind of questions around whether there's a minimum grant request, which there isn't, um, but we are expecting the average um, grant to be between 300,000 and 8.7 million. Um, there is not a need for a minimum lease length or minimum of young people supported in the site, but instead that this is all kind of what Paul was speaking to, that this will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, dependent on the application. Um, I'll hand over now to um, Laura Bell from Resonance, who will provide a bit more intro introduction to the organisation and their role in the fund. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everybody. I'm Lara Bell from Resonance, and I head up our delivering, developing communities team. And uh, for those who don't know us, Resonance have got 20 years in the social investment field, and we would describe ourselves as uh, impact property fund managers with uh, a number of investment funds running across uh, three um, key areas. First one being property funds, which um, are tackling homelessness. Our second one is community um, assets. We're uh, building community-led housing, sports and leisure and energy schemes. And the third one is supporting social enterprises with loans and blended finance. We've got uh, quite a detailed knowledge of property and, and development and capital projects. And we'll be supporting applicants for youth investment fund across the Southwest and the, the Midlands regions. And we have teams based in those areas. So uh, primarily Cornwall, Bristol and Birmingham, where um, we'll be um, positioning relationship managers to work with applicants uh, to help get through the assessment uh, processes for Youth Investment Fund. I think that's it from me. Can I pass on to the next person, please? Yeah, sure. I'll pass you to Jed, who's representing Q. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Lara. So I guess I'm just going to repeat what Lara said, but for the north of England. Um, but perhaps with a bit more, hopefully with a bit more as well. So key funds are a specialist uh, social investor. We're a social enterprise ourselves who invests in other social enterprises. Um, same as uh, same as residents in some ways, we've been going for 22 years now. And our story began um, in South Yorkshire in 1999, 2000. So, Hit by the collapse of industry, um, Keith and wanted to find a new way of breathing life back in the neighbourhoods and support, support new enterprises, create jobs and work with communities. So we were formed primarily, we started out uh, as an organisation that gave out grants and moved into one that actually started giving out grants and loans 
flexible loans. And then more recently, we've we'd sort of been uh, focused a lot more on repayable finance. But um, with COVID and everything that's happened um, with the response there, we've um, we've moved back much more into, into grant giving. So we operate in a very similar space as social investment business and residents um, uh, with colleagues there. As I say, we're primarily in the north of England. So we're going to be looking at the uh, Yorkshire and Humber northwest and the bit of east of England that couldn't be called the south, I suppose, with my limited geography is how, how I'd explain how, how I explain that. Um, we're going to have relationship managers to work with applicants uh, throughout um, throughout the application process, as Lara says. So so very similar. Key funds um, key funds background is working with community and social enterprises that have traditionally been excluded. So those that have been turned down by mainstream banks from mainstream finance. So we tend to fund. Um, a lot of organisations that have traditionally been overlooked, the, the, I suppose um, the, the overlooked is the term I'd use. Some use hard to reach, but I guess it's hard to reach for us is the term that, that, that we'd, we'd usually use. Um, and the one thing in terms of added um, resources that I'd always advise people to look at, we've got on the Key Fund website, um, which is just the keyfund.co.uk, we've got a, a little tab on there on investments called Your Support. And it's um, it's like a resource center. So it's um, as well as SIB and residents and colleagues at NYA who have all of this stuff on their websites. You know, one of the things that we try not to do is um, uh, is make stuff uh, very exclusive. So it's all out there. And we've got resources on there that are business plans, finance plans. Most in, most importantly, I guess for this fund is is sort of property and looking at um, looking at uh, some of the ways that you uh, you could measure up and evaluate what things are going to cost. So um, it's all on there and hopefully should be useful and complementary to what organisations are looking at doing. Um, I'll hand back to Jenny. Thanks. Thank you, Jed. And then finally, Karen and Barry are here representing National Youth Agency. So if you could share a bit more about that, that'd be great. Thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm joined with, by Karen Self, who's the Learning Development Manager at uh, NYA. Uh, my name's Barry Williams. Uh, uh, Karen's um, primarily responsible for the what we've developed in terms of the quality practice framework, which I'm going to talk to to you through a, a little bit now. Um, so um, that's what Karen's sitting on on the panel. She's going to she's going to answer some questions, and, and I'll, I'll pitch in where I can. I'm just going to talk through NYA's role. Um, it's primarily to focus on the um, youth pillar of of the assessments and uh, and the governance of that element, and with the three prime areas that we're looking at. Uh, firstly, through uh, our quality assessment, we'll be embedding quality youth work through um, youth work pra practice, and we're looking at assessment and reviewing, and I'll talk through that process briefly in a while. And the, other, the second element is ensuring youth voice is embedded and central to YIF. That's both from a, a YIF point of view, but equally with, from a point of view of anyone who's at, applying to YIF. And then our third element is ensuring that um, information gets out to the sector alongside our partners, but using our networks, using our partners, using using the, using the variety of communications that what we've done, and 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 talking to organisations, making sure that they're aware of if and if they are um, uh, able to apply for it. So, just going to run through the first area, which is the quality uh, practice review, which is um, which is, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to I'm going to go through it how you would go through it if you're if you're applying. So if you've if you if you get through the EOI process, you'll go through the first um, self-assessment stage, um, which you submit. Um, this is um, a relational process; it's supportive. So um, essentially, you're looking at gaps in your in, in a, looking at for gaps in, in in provision, and that won't stop the um, the process. You won't slow you down in your assessment process or your grants committee process. It's um, it's essentially a relational process, and, and it goes it goes on beyond that. Once you've done that, submitted that. Um, it will review, be reviewed and assessed by two panels. One, one is quality practice panel, which is made up of NYA colleagues, experts in the field, and a youth panel, which we've recruited um, specifically for YIF. And I'll, again, I'll be talking a bit more detail about that. Um, once, you, um, once, you've, once you've got through the grant, grant committee, if you, if you get through that, if you're approved, you will then um, answer the second stage of a self-assessment, which gives us a little bit more information about the organisation and its practices. And, and part of that, you will create a development plan. So we'll be looking at the gaps that you've, you've identified for your self-assessment, and you'll create a development plan. Um, and that will be to deliver on. 
Um, for that, we've got lots of support um, from NYA, both in terms of resources and templates, guidance, et cetera, uh, and one-to-one -one support that we can provide organizations. And um, once you've gone through that development stage, you will um, you will you will fill, you'll fulfill a quality review, which we, we call a quality standard statements, um, which gives you a gives you a, an indication of the journey that you've gone on and, and and gives you evidence for good and or excellent quality youth work provision. Um, the three areas that we're focusing on is participation, youth participation, governance and leadership and youth work practice. So a bit about the youth work panel, we've recruited 20 young people aged 16 to 24, we've employed those young people, um, we're using their expertise, so we felt that it was important that that was recognised and they will be employed um, 13 hours a month um, to assess um, YIF applications. They're geographically spread and they're diverse in terms of range of experience and backgrounds. Um, and this whole process has been young personal led. So right from that, what should the youth panel look like? What should they assess? How they should assess it? Where they should come from uh, and, and numbers? All this has been led uh, and worked in, in co-design with young people. So it's been a long process for us. What will they assess? So um, the, the youth panel will um, assess a specific area of the self-assessment. So it's called, it's, if you go through that, you'll see there's a section B, which is needs to be completed by young people from your provision. Um, and they look at um, and they look at three areas. Um, youth participation within that provision and how potentially those young people have supported the development of the proposal. Um, how young people are involved in the needs analysis of the local community of young people. And um, also how young people are involved in making sure that, that provision is equitable, it's access accessible, and it's inclusive to the community that that provision serves. Um, how they will um, how they will assess it? Well, the information that is collected from the self assessment will point to a report, and they and young people have a whole process to go through. It's a it's a it's a it's a format that's been developed with young people, um, and and gives us a, a, the ability to be consistent and stand and be able to standardise it. As I say, that is listening to young people from provision um, directly from, to the youth panel. There is a um, also a, a um, a request that you upload uh, an audio or video um, 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 up to recording to this um, section B. So please be ready for that. If not, if that's not possible, if the young people do not want to do that, we, we have other elements, but we have to do that. We have to do that as a case by case um, process. Um, final bit for me, sector engagement. How are we doing that? Well, I've talked about how we've, we, we've had a, a communication and marketing strategy that's supported the, the raising the awareness of youth. But we're also working with a sector, sector expert panel and that will continue throughout, uh, throughout the pro programme. Um, and they are supporting us, um, us in informing the sector guidance and support. And as I say, that will be ongoing. And those, those representatives range from national organisations, regional youth work units, uh, uniform sector and colleagues from the diversity and equity um, uh, um, organisations. That's that's it from me. Back to you, Jenny. Thanks, Barry. Um, so hopefully we've, we've run through that in half an hour. So hopefully we can put some time aside now to questions that you may have. Um, we are currently, we have nine at the moment. So I would really encourage you to kind of put them through um, and if we don't get them to, through today, we can kind of share that information with you immediately. So um, just first, someone was asking around being able to access the recording of this session. So um, we are recording it so we can share it and you can watch it retrospectively. So I think we'll upload it on our YouTube website um, that kind of provides an so you can kind of look back at it. I know it's a lot of information in the day. Um, the second question we had was around um, the purchase of a property. So I think this is something that we are, need to be quite clear on. The funding itself will not be available to purchase a site or a building. So that's kind of a key thing. So to kind of move forward and for us to get you to that grant assessment, you need to either be owning that building, or having a, a lease on it, um, 
quite quickly. So it's it's a common question that we get um, and something that I think we should be clear about. Um, one of the questions that I might put out to um, maybe Paul or, and I think we could, I can speak to it as well, but we're talking about partnerships. So are local partnerships essential or will standalone bids be accepted um, with the possibility of local competition? So I think that's something that Paul, you could speak to. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think <clears throat> if we do, we are trying to encourage uh, people from the same area to take a, a common view of how best they can access the fund and what uh, they can do uh, to eliminate unnecessary competition uh, and disruptive competition uh, between um, different organisations. But having said that, um, you know, each individual bid that comes to the fund will be judged on its merits. Some of those merits may well be that they are they make sense from a strategic point of view and a part of a uh, of a uniformed uh, of, of, of a of a, um, of a of a codified agreement. But uh, if there is a, for example, a weak link in a portfolio bid with a number of um, with a number of separate um, uh, investment opportunities in it, that weak link uh, will be judged on its own merits, and the strongest link will be judged on its own merits. Um, so, in, and in those places where it may well be that there isn't a consensus on what's best, or there is only one or two individual organisations who are capable of putting a bid into YIF, despite our best efforts to try and um, <clears throat> try and make sure that the um, that the, 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 as many people as possible can bid, then those individual bids will be considered again on their own merits. So, um, you know, the idea that um, that there is a um, there is that you have to have some kind of linking partnership isn't true. It may well be that, that, that some of the advantages that come with that partnership may add to the quality of any individual bid, but every individual bid will be based on its own merits. Thanks, Paul. I think that's helpful. Um, we also had a question around um, the EOI specifically and asking around costs, so how much projects will cost. So how, ac how accurate do the costs need to be at submission of EOI? Um, and if there's any help that we can get to cost our project. Um, just so speaking, my experience, and maybe the partners can kind of step in afterwards, is that generally what we found is that we are happy to ex um, accept estimates of costs that don't necessarily, we accept, expect to be changed over a period of time. So at the moment, the environment is very turbulent around costing, and we are kind of like taking into consideration that maybe what something that you would have costed six months ago might be a different cost when we move it to um, the grant assessment period and that's something we're open to and once it reaches that relationship manager stage we can kind of um, understand those costs in a better way and how you came about them I think is kind of a key point of that. Um, do any of the other speakers have anything to add to that question around costs and assessment? I was only just going to say it's it would be useful to understand uh, how project costs have been assessed at the point of expression of interest uh, and and when those were done. Um, but they they will be looked at as part of the assessment process anyway. Thank you, Lara. Um, so the key another question we have from an attendee is, is there a maximum funding per geographical area? Um, I can answer that if there's anyone who wants to speak in. No, I don't think there is a there is a, a geographical cap or limit on a particular area. Having said that, uh, if we are going to one of the what well, I did say that one of the key things that we are going to look at is value for money. And um, and so the cost per uh, head of eligible young person in the area will be a factor. So it will not be a surprise uh, if we spend, you know more in Birmingham than we spend in Devon. Um, I think that's going to be, uh, that's, that, 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 that shouldn't be a, a particular issue for anybody. Um, but, um, you know, if, if somebody comes in with a, an extremely good bid that gives us a great deal of additionality in, uh, in, in a smaller area, or uh, we have um, a number of bids that, uh, fr from areas where, they got, where we've got um, a, a lot of young people that um that might that that, that might uh, if you like uh be less than a kind of cost per head that you might expect we're prepared to be we're prepared to be flexible but obviously um you know where there are the most eligible young people and good quality bids we will expect to spend um, a significant amount of money in those places 
Great, thank you, Paul. Um, a question maybe for NYA, um, which is around um, an organization's clients that they might work with or young people that they work with have multiple learning dis disabilities and might not necessarily be able to communicate with peers. How um, is that um, being interpreted in like participation assessments? So the question was um, from Claire, I think, and she said, um, uh, can we be can we be flexible? Absolutely, we can be flexible and um, just get in touch if there's any issues. But in terms of the original, the, the section B, the majority of it is about is is um, is is writing that information in, and you can use you know you can work with those young people if uh, uh, and you can put that into the into the answer that scribe it for them that's a better word you can scribe it for them um but absolutely if there's any any issue we'll just get in touch and we we will uh, we'll work you on that have you got anything to add karen yeah no just to confirm that really and where it says the the video or the audio recording um it also states quite clearly if you're getting contact if for whatever reason this isn't possible and we'll work with you to develop a process that is appropriate for the young people you're working with and that might include throughout the whole of the process. So it might not just be for the self-assessment, it might be for the whole, the whole of this process as well. So we can bespoke that approach. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, if a third, or, third sector organisation is leading or is the accountable body in an application, how will financial sustainability of the project be assessed? Um, and from my interpretation well from my understanding is that that organization is the organization that will be assessed their financial and um, sustainability will be assessed in that context but is there anything else Mara, Jed, or you would like to add to that uh, no exactly if you're the lead organization and you're the organization that's going to be the assessed if you know if you're the organization who own the building uh, that we're that we're investing in, then it's the it's it, that that's 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 that I think is the uh, or has the long lease on the building, then that's the uh, that's where we're that's where we're working. Thanks. Um, the next question would be: Can costs associated to develop the application, um, i.e., staff time to develop the bid, be covered? Um, and I think the answer to that is um, no. We cannot fund retros um, costs retrospectively that you might have been using to build up the project. Um, we do have we do have work that um, a possibility for revenue funding, but that is more the development of the project, working directly on the building. Um, through staff costs. So it's not something that we can fund. This is the same for um, any planning costs that you might be incurring before you get to the grant assessment stage. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's it. Um, I'm just looking through all the things I, so just a couple of like practical questions that we've had. So can there be funding for the an extension of a building? So yep, yeah, definitely. So we're currently looking to build the, de the development of refurbishments of buildings, renovations, and also the building of a, of a building, if that makes sense. So it's quite a range of different projects that we're envisioning. Following this, um, so the purchase of any sort of moving vehicles, that's I mentioned earlier, cannot be included um, in that bid. So it's just something I wanna highlight um, separately. Um, I think there is a question around the timing of when to submit an EOI. So I think this is something that we get a lot. So from Tony, uh, we are ready to go, but we're still waiting for councillors to confirm the land we can have as our ward has very little um, land to develop on. They're keen to back the building of a youth hub, but struggling for the set, set space as the ward is so populated. Should we still register our expression of interest form or should we wait until this is secured? Um, so from my interpretation, I think generally we're really open for organisations to submit an expression of interest to kind of show where they are at at that moment. So that might be that you haven't necessarily confirmed the land yet. I think it's just going with the assumption that you might not necessarily be allocated a relationship manager and move to assessment prior to securing that land. So it's kind of you will be asked less questions because you won't be ready to go within the next three months. But it might be something that you would look to doing, be something that will look to maintain and be in touch with you during that period. So when you are ready and you have secured that site, we might be able to move you on to assessment quite quickly. That's kind of the main timeline I think we're looking. It, it is a case by case basis, um, but there's always an opportunity to withdraw your bid. 
Um, and if things happen quicker than you suspected, we're also able to kind of adapt to that. Um, if ever, is everyone happy with that kind of answer? Anything you want to add on to? Padjet. I was just going to say it's it's probably interesting, Jenny, for the put from the perspective of end users as well. It's if we look at the um, the frequently asked questions, it's an it's an open process. So we expect where there's just an expressions of interest that's open. There's not as a lot of people we're used to on capital uh, funds uh, deadlines and windows and deadlines and windows with constant sort of yeah, spikes in um, in 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 action. So yeah, it's just a rolling uh expressions of interest so i think if you put in an early expression of interest you're more likely to get a not now rather than a no i think it's fair to say panel yeah definitely yeah so it, there's no harm in kind of throwing your ring uh card in the ring is that the phrase um but it is a case of it might not move as quickly as you want and i think that's also alongside the other external kind of um priorities that we're looking at at the moment which is these larger scale projects that are ready to go um so yeah so um someone mentioned if uh, you have a lease for a building is there a minimum term and um, that you would be prepared to be in, to invest in so the example here is 14 years um again there is no minimum for like number of years on a lease so it was something that we kind of were thinking about but we're very aware that a lot of youth organizations are working with quite small short leases and it's not something that we wanted to exclude people from but kind of as Paul was talking about of like um, geographical areas and numbers of scales, it's, it depends on a case by case basis. So if it is kind of a project that you, um, that we think is really kind of meets all of those um, ideas around sustainability, resilience, but is a shorter lease, it might be a smaller grant, that's something that we'd be really looking to consider. Um, so I think that's kind of mentioned a, a few times. Um, so I'm just trying to multitask and do our do the, the questions as we go. Um, so let me just I've skipped over a few. So um, we've done that. Not sure. Um, so just of the is there a flow chart of the application process available? So at the moment on the website of the youth investment funds, we have kind of a step by step process. So at the moment, there's only one application form that we're um that you need to submit and any other sort of any provision of information extra will be through a relationship manager so if you look to that that should kind of be a bit clearer about what happens up to assessment stage kind of the information that barry was providing around that assessment points and what we're looking to in terms of sustainability um resilience etc we're hoping to provide more information on a later point so we're kind of two months into our youth investment fund, we're having our first assessment panel um, in the next few weeks. So it's kind of, we, we want to share and kind of for you to understand how we'll be assessing what we're looking for in a bit more detail. Um, and hopefully we can update the youth investment fund website as we go through in due course. Um, Jenny, can, I, can I just, we've got, um, so if you go to our website and I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat, but I think it's gone to individual, but um, in on there, we've got a, a number of documents, um, one of which is a guidance document, which has a flow chart in from, from our process perspective and where it fits in. So there's a couple of flow, flow charts uh, in there. And there's a, there's also, there's a question um, um, before from Claire about, um, about, about the assessment, self-assessment template again that's on that website but i don't know if it, it went to everyone but yeah it's on there and I, I we can send that we can send that around to everyone the um the actual um, website link thanks barry yeah hopefully i can collate like a more formal like summary of all of your questions together and send around um one of the questions around procurement so kind of what are we are there limitations on the type of procurement route to deliver the project? So projects with high level of sustainability targets normally benefit from early appointment of contractors in order to work together with the design team instead of simply going for a competitive dinner, uh, tender. Are there any restrictions about that? Um, so I think the first thing to kind of mention is what Jed has mentioned previously is the timeline of the um, the timeline of the fund. So just one thing when you're thinking about procurement, there is a restriction on kind of when money needs to be spent by. So we need all funds to be kind of spent by March 2025. So that is a factor in kind of how you're deciding and, um, and carrying out your procurement. And 
is there anything else anyone wants to kind of speak to procure, the theme of procurement um, in this group or we're kind of happy with that? Lovely. Um, okay, I think for, for the time being, um, I think we've covered a lot of the questions unless um, anyone in the team feels that I've missed missed out one on this like huge list of ones but if not basically as long as it's in the chat we can kind of provide it um I've just a couple are coming through so do you have to own the building or hold lease on the building the answer is yes so the that is kind of a key requirement for the for the fund um and the question around what the, semin the seminars in the future will kind of cover. So the one on the 6th of October will cover very similar themes to this. So just kind of an introduction to the fund, an opportunity for you to ask any questions. Um, and then later on, we're hoping to run more kind of specialized um, sessions around probably a bit more detail around the assessment process, um, working with relationship managers. Um, and if there is kind of a need for it, there's another, it would be kind of interesting on um, what would be interesting is around the case for, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought, um, is for actually the information and the questions that we're require, requiring in the expression of interest. So if kind of, if you have specific questions or kind of what those mean, what information we're trying to gather from you, would, we can also run sessions on that. The last question I just wanna highlight is around um, funding that can be spent on outdoor space connected to the building with Kinta Fund. So kind of where does that sort of come? So, so not necessarily the site itself, but the space around it. Um, Paul, do you kind of have a perspective on DCMS's ideas on outdoor space within that? Um, again, I mean, I think, you know, you, you can do um, you can do youth work in, uh, as, as easily in outdoors as, in, as indoors. Um, I think one of the things that, um, you know, some, a lot of outdoor spaces have the ability to do, especially um, during, um, uh, you know, if we talk about outdoor education centres, for example, is that they could, they're often able to bring in um, income uh, to support uh, youth provision uh, when, um, uh, you know, um, through, uh, through commercial or other, uh, or other contracts. So, I don't think, so that's, that's, that's another advantage that they can bring. Um, but uh, to be honest, no, I mean, I think there's, uh, there's, the outdoor education sector, if we're talking about those kind of facilities, are just as eligible as anybody else. Uh, again, it comes back to the the um, the key outcomes we're looking for, which is youth work outcomes, which is additionality, value for money, sustainability. Um, so uh, just because it, 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 the, the, uh, we're, we're talking about whether it takes place um, with or without a roof isn't really a relevant question. Thanks, Paul. That was very helpful. Um, Another question around um, how will, I was wrapping up and now I've had a flurry of, uh, of questions, um, how will value for money be assessed? So I think that's kind of something that we've brought up a couple of times, but how, how where do we see um, value for money being assessed? Okay. I mean, I think there's two key points here is uh, how much money do you want and how much additionality is it buying, um, which is part of that value for money calculation, obviously. Um, and not only that, but I mean, if you can bring in, um, if you can bring in uh, gap, uh, if you can bring in additional funding for what we're trying to achieve as well, match funding, that will also, uh, that will also help. Um, but, um, you know, those, I mean, you know, those, those are some of the key care questions, but I, again, case by case basis, if you're, uh, if, if you're uh, one of the, if you've got particular issues in terms of what you're trying to deliver and you're in an area where we want to, where we want to achieve something, but it's quite hard to do. Um, and uh, then that will be assessed on, on, the, on that basis. Uh, in, in, in other areas, we might expect some, uh, so, so, some different costs per head. It, it really depends on, um, on, 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 on local circumstances in, uh, in, in, in many cases. Thanks, Paul. I think that rings true a lot of the fund of kind of where we're open and it's kind of on an individual basis is kind of where we're doing that assessment, which kind of um, the final question I'm just going to cover is any mid reporting required required during the development term. And I think I just want to kind of touch upon the relationship managers. So social investment business um, residents and key farm will all be working as relationship managers, kind of working you through the, not only the application, but also post application. Now, I think this is post-approval, should I say. So I think there's kind of, I just want to emphasize that what we're trying, we're still kind of ironing out those kind of post-approval 
um, requirements of like during development. But generally what we're trying to take on is to build relationships between the applicant and the relationship manager to take forward and where we can kind of have updates on the how the project is working is kind of how we, we want to do that via the relationship manager. I think is something that we kind of want to achieve. Um, so it's not just the sending out a form or anything like that, but kind of hopefully you'll be able to have more of a personable relationship with the individuals throughout assessment. Um, so I think that's it for now. Um, is there anything anyone of the panelists want to mention before um, we go? Just, you'll, you'll, oh, Lara, please. Yeah, I just wanted to um, talk to that procurement question again because uh, it kind of caught me slightly off guard. I mean, we, it's probably one that we'll need to consider and come back on um, in terms of procurement routes. We, uh, Jenny, it might be worth mentioning um, the uh, two frameworks that we're going to have uh, that are going to be um, useful in this space as well. Um, but I think we could probably put our heads together and, and come out with some basic guidance. On, on procurement generally. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. And it's it's like, this is where these forums are really helpful to kind of see what you guys, what the organizations are thinking through and trying to do. But yeah, this is something, it's something that we're working through. And I think the other thing to emphasize is that we're two months in. So it's kind of, we're still ironing out and trying to think through how we can best help applicants and kind of think through with those external deadlines about timelines, et cetera, how to help you kind of work through those challenges. I think the best thing so thank you um is there anything else are we happy I know, I know there are kind of lots of questions so i think it's just a case of we'll hopefully get back to you and kind of summarize some of those points um yeah okay well thank you to the panelists and i hope everyone has a great day um the youth investment fund has an inquiry email so yif at sidgroup.org.uk um, that I'm Anne. So if you have any other questions, like, please send them along. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.